1989, Paul Simon began writing a musical. In 1997, a musical called The Caveman started previews at the Marquee Theater. Caveman. 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 For, the, for those of you who don't know, the show was based on the true story of Salvador Agron, a 16-year-old Puerto Rican street gang member who, in 1959, stabbed two teenage boys to death. He was wearing a cape at the time, and newspapers called him the Cape Man. The stars were Mark Anthony, Ruben Blades, and Ednita Nazario, all making their Broadway debuts. The Cape Man is each of their only Broadway credit to date. The cast also included Natasha Diaz, Cass Morgan, Luba Mason, and Sarah Ramirez. The cast was almost entirely Hispanic. Some headshots for you. It's a commercial look, and that's more of her dramatic. <laughs> So out though. Um, from the beginning, all anticipated a Paul Simon score for the show packed with his trademark brilliance, um, and, and he was known for songs filled with stories and characters. Simon seemed like an ideal songwriter to cross over into musical theater. Nobel Peace Prize winning poet Derek Walcott would co-write the book and lyrics to The Cape Man with Simon. While the subject of the musical was incredibly unorthodox, clearly, the initial public reaction was excitement for a socially significant musical by a great songwriter. Before hiring a director or working on The Caveman as a show, Simon wanted to make an album of the songs. He spent one million dollars creating a studio album. And in a New York Times Sunday preview about The Caveman, Simon said, this is all about music. The story, I think, is an interesting story, but I'm not a sociologist or even a playwright, so I'm interested as a composer in things that I love, and this is all about how I fell in love with music and who I was when that love happened. That's kind of a taste of what was playing at the same time. Which is like Natalie Portman and um, Diary of Anne Frank. Uh, journalists began predicting that Simon had too much control over the production and wasn't used to collaborating in a theatrical sense. At one point, the Dodgers met with Simon about coming on board as producers. They advised him to find a director immediately and not spend so much time recording the music. Simon responded, What you're telling me is that I don't know what I'm doing, and while I'm still in the creative process, that's very harmful to me. <laughs> Simon wound up hiring every single member of the creative team himself before hiring a director, and the production eventually went through four. Paul is obsessive about what he's trying to do, one creative team member told the New York Times. He once spent half an hour with the whole Cape Man cast and the band standing by as he moved a tambourine around the room to see where it would sound best. This kind of perfection has lent itself to some of the most brilliant songs and recordings of our contemporary music, but in musical theater, one has much less control. Freaking out. Uh, oh my god, shit Paul Simon says. <laughs> producer at the time told the Times, uh, there's no one there to edit Paul Simon in the room, no one to rein him in, and he's a control freak. Nobody is going to say no to Paul Simon. Not me. Um, on top of that, many found that the story was incredibly offensive. When the Cape Man started previews, protesters gathered outside of the marquee carrying signs and statements like, murder is not entertainment. Relatives of the Cape Man's murder victims accused the show of capitalizing on and romanticizing an unforgivable tragedy. Meanwhile, the production going on inside, to their credit, did not shy away from incorporating footage of the real Salvador Agron. While there are other musicals about murderers, from Sweeney Todd to West Side Story, these shows didn't have audiences filled with people who remembered reading about the real live incident in the newspapers. In fact, Salvador Agron had killed his two victims on 45th Street in between 9th and 10th Avenues, just two blocks from the marquee, right near Yum Yum Bangkok. And across the street from Rosie's, Rosie's Broadway Kids. <laughs> But still, careful kids. <laughs> no, no live stream for me. It's gonna be a nymph next year. Um, so on the one hand, uh, <laughs> I'll play it to your face. Um, I think Isaac's here too from there, brother. Uh, I just not here, but Lynn and Mike are here. Hi guys. Yay, hi guys. Anyway, uh, sure, on the one hand, the Cape Man did bring many Hispanic audience members to the theater for the first time, mainly because of salsa star Mark Antony. But on the other hand, many found the show filled with Puerto Rican stereotypes. Simon and his team aimed to tell the story of the Cape Man with no judgment, but instead, many critics found that it told the story with no perspective. They wanted an indictment of society for allowing the conditions of poverty that created the Cape Man. Efforts were made to portray ca the characters honestly, and this led to sequences like shoplifting clothes, where a store was robbed in front of its helpless owners. The show was 
hard edged in tone with songs like You Fucked Up My Life, uh, <laughs> which Agron sang to his former gang while in prison. After Agron had murdered the boys and was captured, he famously said, I don't care if I burn, my mother could watch me, a line that was also incorporated into the show. This was no thoroughly modern Millie. <laughs> It always works well. Uh, to those who said that this wasn't a fit subject for a Broadway musical, Simon said, uh, we want to ask what a person must do to receive forgiveness, uh, and if people truly have the power to forgive. Many in the cast were very dedicated to the difficulties of the piece. Ruben Blades, playing the older Salvador, famously gave up the star dressing room for a much smaller one, which he had redone to look like a jail cell so he could get into character each night. Sutton had that change back. <laughs> Chronological personality. Um, the Broadway community was divided. The Cape Man had many supporters who admired its brave, dark approach and its score littered with gold. But many were offended by Paul Simon's statements to the press about Broadway. He made repeated remarks about how his intentions were to enliven a stale art form and how Broadway was behind the times in many ways. Being quoted this way while your show is having a trouble preview period is probably not the way to get the theater community rooting for you. Uh, opening was delayed for three weeks, and ticket buyers during those weeks were refunded the difference between the preview price and the post-opening price. I can't remember the last time that happened, but that's always crazy. Uh, Jerry Zachs was brought in, as he is, uh, and he... <laughs> the elevator with Jerry's act sometimes, so I'm gonna cut that out of the video too. Um, <laughs> and he cut 30 minutes off the Cape Man immediately, as well as clarifying the storyline. His fee, as well as the extra rehearsals, added at least half a million to the show's cost. The Cape Man also opened in between the openings of The Lion King and Ragtime. Oh. <laughs> That's called Simon just as a turkey. <laughs> Family Values. No, just kidding. <laughs> Eat me, saute, and barbecue, if anyone knows the sequel to Adam's Family. Um, so, Variety waited, <coughs> as they do. Great songs. Paul Simon's music for The Cape Man ranks among the best Broadway scores of this or any recent season. An exquisite blend of salsa, 1950s American doo-wop, and Simon's own impeccable artistry. Simon's lyrics are, not surprisingly, perfectly crafted narratives, but they tell The Cape Man's story so explicitly that they leave little room or necessity for the actors to act. There's some people at opening. <laughs> they look thrilled. <laughs> we won't name them by name, you know their names. Uh, reviewing the original cast album, Ken Mandelbaum said, The Cape Man was neither rock musical, pop opera, nor traditional musical theater piece, but it is filled with haunting music, strange, tantalizing, lovely sequences, and several outstanding songs. The recording serves to remind one that the Cape Man was done a disservice by being mounted directly on Broadway, more an oratorio or a song cycle inspired by the life and culture of Salvador Agron than a musical. It did not offer conventional character development or dramatic structure. The order of numbers could at times be shuffled with no loss to the action. Offering it initially as a stage musical inevitably led to a feeling of bewilderment on the part of an audience expecting to see something that operated like a dramatic theater piece. Well, like, oh. months and months of people's lives, and Ken Mandelbaum gives it to you in four sentences. I love it. Uh, those are also some interesting headlines I've had. People were very eager to use uh, Paul Simon puns in their, in their headlines. The critics were, so there you go. So uh, while, while the original production closed after only 68 performances, The Cape Man has recently received uh, varied acclaim in productions at BAM and the Delacorte. And one excellent number in the show is Bernadette, sung by the, sung by the young Salvador to his girl. As Ethan Morden said, my old pal, um, it's Rock's version of what used to be called a charm song. Here to sing Bernadette from The Cape Man, Jared Weiss.
tonight.